Let's take our Bibles tonight. We're turning to 1 John, and hopefully we will conclude, at least try to wrap up our treatment of these verses. We've been in 1 John 5, the first five verses for a month. And so tonight, uh, let's go there again. 1 John chapter 5. And as you're turning, please remember that this epistle, 1 John, was written by the same John who wrote the gospel according to John, but the gospel was written so that people might know that Jesus is the Christ and might be saved. 1 John is written to people who have already been saved so that we might ourselves have assurance of our salvation. And uh, there are many internal uh, proofs or evidences of that fact. And I'm glad that we can know that we're saved and know it for sure. All right, 1 John chapter 5, and beginning at verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful scripture. Help us tonight to be encouraged that we in turn, Lord, may encourage others. Thank you for the internal proofs of our salvation. Thank you for assurance. And we thank you tonight as we look at the Word of God. We see ourselves in the Word and thank you for what you teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. We have some key words. You want to underscore victory. We have victory in Jesus. We love to sing number 341, victory in Jesus. And we love to sing I'm on the winning side and other songs of that positive nature. No matter what we're going through or what we've just been through, we are declared righteous by God because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so we have victory. On a practical level, we can experience it moment by moment as we yield to the Spirit of God in our life. We are those who overcome. We continuously overcome as we have the terminology here. And what are some areas in which we have victory in and through the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we have victory over fear. We know what the Scripture says. Scripture tells us, God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's 2 Timothy 1, 7. That's a scripture to memorize. And the reason you need to memorize that, and I need to memorize it and use it frequently, is because you will need sometime in the next seven days to tell somebody that verse. You're either going to have to tell yourself if you're facing surgery or looking at uh, some challenge, uh, you're having to deal with some unpleasant person or situation, and so you'll need it for yourself. Or someone's going to be saying, I just don't know what I'm going to do. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He helps us to keep from losing our mind. And we do this through Him. We have victory over fear. And one of the things that is feared the most, not the most, but is feared among those that are listed high, is the fear of death. People are afraid of what's coming next. In Hebrews chapter 2, please turn there with me, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now look this way for a moment. You say, I'm experiencing fear, apprehension about what's going to happen when I close my eyes and I stop breathing. And that is a normal human response. Because built into all of us is a desire for survival. We want to try to live if we possibly can. However, with respect to what we understand spiritually, there 
does not need to be fear of death itself because we know the one who has conquered death. Satan operates in the realm of fear and he wants you to fear in such a way as to not trust the Lord. The absence of your trust in the Lord will cause you to lapse into that natural human apprehension. So what, what pushes that aside? The victory that we have through Jesus Christ. So here it is. Uh, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. Now, <clears throat> that means right now we have everlasting life. And then the rest of John chapter 5, 24 goes this way. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. We don't have to fear death because of what Jesus Christ has already accomplished. And if we're depending on Him, trusting in Him, we won't lapse into that human apprehension and be overwhelmed by the fear of death. Now, related to that, the devil wants us to think from time to time that maybe we didn't really mean business when we got saved and maybe we're lost. And if in fact we're lost, then we start to worry about it when we call home and nobody picks up the phone and we think the rapture has taken place and we got left. I know somebody, I know somebody, whenever that would happen, they would call through the church directory until they finally found somebody that they were pretty sure was saved, and then they were feeling okay because that person hadn't gone, so they knew they hadn't been left. Now, that is more common than you know. That's very common. Uh, partly to blame are preachers who will say something like this. Sometimes mom will say this, or dad will say this to kids. If you were really saved, you wouldn't think that way. If you were really saved, you wouldn't do those things. You want to bet? Do you know that under provocation, because of the old nature, and because of our succumbing to the old nature, there's just about nothing that a person could not potentially do as a believer and still be saved. Because we're not saved by something we've done to keep ourselves saved. We're saved because of God keeping His Word. Say, well... But I've been saved now. Yes. Now here's the difference. As a saved person, we can still sin, but we don't feel good about it. As a saved person, when we sin, we feel guilty about it. Got my hand up. How many of you feel guilty every now and then about sin? Come on. Yeah. All right. Sure. Because that's, <laughs> that's part of the new birth. We, we don't feel comfortable. We're, we're being fit for heaven, and instead, we're trying to Go back to the old ways and do the old things and fit in the old patterns. And guess what? We feel guilt. God has given us that. And you ought to thank God for it so that, you know, we keep short accounts. We confess our sins and He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, I'm not giving anybody here an excuse or a free pass tonight on sin. Because whom the Lord loveth, He what? Chasteneth. The flip side to the teaching of eternal security is... Every single one of us who is saved is going to get chastised for our sin. If you're not getting chastised for your sin, then maybe you need to look closely and examine whether or not you've ever been saved. All right, so sometimes preachers are partly to blame and sometimes parents who say, you know, if you're really saved, I got saved, you know the story, in Vacation Bible School on June the 17th, 1955. Now, if you look at the date, you see that that is a little over two weeks away from the 4th of July. And in California, on the 4th of July in those days, people would have fireworks. And sometimes they would have uh, illegal firecrackers. Firecrackers were illegal. You don't have firecrackers in California because it's always been a dry state. They call it the Golden State. That's because in the summertime, everything's brown. People who visit here from California say, oh, it's so green here. There's a reason why. Unless you got your lawn, you know, watered 24-7 and you live someplace where they've got, you know, uh, water and humidity and so forth, everything is brown in the summertime. So it's called the Golden State. That's why it's the Golden State, because it's all dead. But uh, anyway, so much about California. Uh, my brother 
It's his fault. He's eight years older than I am. He had a paper route. And he had illegal firecrackers. And he had them in his paper sack. The old fashioned paper sack. And I saw him put them there. And I had just been saved two weeks before. And I thought my big brother's got them. Let me try these out. And so I took a handful of his illegal firecrackers. And some of his matches that he should not have had. And I went across the, the fruit orchard to the other side about a block away. Well, somehow I must have left a trail. Because about the time everything was going pop, 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 pop. And I was having a good time at six years of age temporarily. Be sure your sin will find you out. My brother and my father came around the corner. And I was there. I mean, it was going pop, 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 pop. It, there was no use trying to cover my sin. I mean, I was caught. And my dad said, go home. Now, he didn't even give me a ride in the car. I had to walk the distance and think about what I had done. And he said, I'll meet you in the garage. Now, we didn't, we didn't have a woodshed. We were too poor to afford a woodshed. Go to the garage meant only one thing. I was about to face the judgment. Uh, and uh, my dad is, was an old-fashioned disciplinarian. He believed in doing it the Bible way. Uh, I've searched the scriptures, but I haven't found this. But I believe it is scriptural. He would always he'd take off his belt. He'd double it up. And, um, and it's somewhere in the Bible. But, um, and then he'd say, son, take a hold of my hand. And I'd take hold of his hand, and he'd take hold of mine like this. He'd hold me like that. And he'd take that double-up belt, and then he'd proceed to uh, apply that to uh, a place that God has provided for disciplinary purposes. And uh, my feet never touched the ground. I, I did circles and just kept, uh, just kept going in circles until he wore me out. Now, he had told me that it was going to hurt him more than it hurt me. He lied every time. Because I know it hurt me more than it hurt him. But he meant in a different way. We got all done with that. And as bad as that hurt, you know what hurt me worse? I was six years old, and my mother said to me, she said, Brad, I thought you got saved. Well, I had gotten saved. And even through that, I didn't doubt my salvation. But sometimes, when we behave like we're not saved, people doubt our salvation, and they make comments. And if I were going to doubt my salvation, it would be based on something like that. But I have never in all these 60 some years ever doubted my salvation because I knew that I did what the Bible said when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior and He saved me and even though I didn't act like it when I, you know, when I saw my brother's fireworks, took his firecrackers and set them off, I still know that I was saved and nothing that I did changed that. Now it may be that some people lack assurance and they fear the judgment. They fear the rapture will take place and they'll be left behind. If you're saved, you have no fear of that. You don't have any justifiable fear of that. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Romans 5, 8, 9, and 10. I have no problem with my assurance. How about you? All right. Now, what it all boils down to is this. We know who the enemy is. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil is a real person. And the devil has been operating in the realm of ideas and thoughts and concepts. And he tries to implant ideas in our mind that in our flesh we'll act upon. If we buy into the thoughts and ideas and concepts that he puts in our mind and we accept those as our own, then He's got us. Because we possess an old nature. And so what do we have to do? Please uh, turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. and Everybody's favorite verse, you know, casting all your care upon Him. Following that, 1 Peter 5, 8, 9, and 10 says, Be sober. Be vigilant. Be sober. Now what does it mean to be sober? You say, well, it means don't be drunk. But it means more than that. The word sober in the Bible means to have your feet flat on the ground. To be standing firm. To be sober means to stand firm. And so obviously, 
it means not drunk because the person who's drunk is teetering back and forth. But to be sober means to have, have your wits about you and to be settled in the matter of the devil. Now, I hate the devil with every fiber of my being, every part of me. Uh, I have done business with the devil. I know that he is real. He is the fallen archangel, Lucifer. And he has a myriad of demons throughout a military complex, principalities, powers, and so forth, that uh, make up his, uh, his army here on earth. And he operates in the realm of our atmosphere. And he works on us. And those demons do not pick you up. They, they do not have brute force power against a Christian. The power of the devil and demons is in the realm of ideas, of concepts. So we need to guard our heart. We need to protect our mind. We need to gird up the loins of our mind and be prepared against the, the thoughts that Satan will place in our mind. So be sober. you got to be in the Word. you got to be settled on the Word. Be vigilant. You've got to anticipate. We, we need to be aware of the fact of how Satan works. And we need to have an idea of where our weaknesses are because that's where he's going to come against us in the area of our weaknesses. Maybe your area of weakness is greed. Maybe it's covetousness. Maybe it's uh, bigotry, hate. Maybe it's lust. Maybe it's, I don't know what it is. I, I can't even suggest what it might be. But there are, of course, many sins in the Bible and temptation to sin is real with all of us and Satan knows he can keep a record. You know, I'm told, now I'm not a computer guy, but I'm told that you can take a computer and uh, with the hard drive and with whatever else they can do, and I'm told that you can trace where that computer has been and what, that, what business that computer has been doing. Well, Satan has access to our computer, and he knows where we've been and what we've done. He knows all about our weaknesses. We sing, what a friend we have in Jesus, and Jesus knows our every weakness. Well, what an enemy we have in the devil, and he knows our every weakness. And he's going to come after us. I'm telling you tonight, Satan is going to come after you. Perhaps you're one who is easily discouraged or depressed. Maybe your address has frequently been despair, the slew of despond. And maybe you're one of those people that just, you know, you just dwell in the dark corners. Satan knows that. He's going to try to get you there. Now, you know what? You, you, shouldn't have, you should not be viewing old, sad movies. You should, not be, you should not be reading old, sad, morose things. If you are melodramatic, if you, if you have um, a, a tendency toward that, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be reading or viewing anything like that because Satan knows he can use that to make you feel bad, to make you feel sorry for yourself. They used to call it melancholy. You know what I'm talking about. Some of the greatest servants of God suffered from it. Do you know that? Spurgeon, the silver-tongued prince of preachers, suffered from melancholy. So much so that he would go away for months at a time. Now, he also had other physical ailments, but he was depressed. The man who pastored the world's largest church, he could preach to 20,000 in Exeter Hall. And he would get depressed. So, if Spurgeon could get depressed, so could you. And maybe that's an issue. I don't know. I'm not going to mention any names, but some of the dear people with whom I've been associated through the years, some of my mentors also suffered from melancholy. One individual especially would bury his face in his hands for hours. And when I would ask later about it, he would say, it's just horrible, it's beyond description. I can't even tell you how horrible it is. So now how could that be? How could a servant of God go through that? Because we're all put together in such a manner that if the devil knows the area of weakness and if he can introduce thoughts and ideas or temptations in that area, it may be that melancholy, it may be that depression, it may be those other lists that I gave you. Be sober, be vigilant. You might as well expect him. He's coming around the corner. 
Because your adversary, the devil, and he is your adversary in mine, as a roaring lion. I'm so glad for that word as. It doesn't say he's a roaring lion. He says he is as a roaring lion. That is a simile. It's a metaphor. It is a figure of speech. So that's his manner. He's as a roaring lion. He puts off a roar. Walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. If you are a born-again believer, in order for him to take a chunk out of you, you've got to give him an invitation. You've got to open up the door and invite him in. Whom resist steadfast in the faith? I'm going to tell you right now. God has not equipped the devil with any defensive weapons. If you resist him steadfast in the faith, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You get out your Bible, start quoting the Bible, say, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ, and by his authority and by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I, I claim victory over you and all of your temptation. Be gone! And guess what? You have victory in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, but the God of all grace. I mean, that's quite a description. He's the God of all grace. A grace for every need. Grace for every challenge of life. What's your challenge tonight? God's got grace for that. The God of all grace who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus after that ye have suffered a while, while we're here, down here on earth, this is, the, this is the room in which we suffer, make you perfect or complete, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That's one of my mother's favorite verses after all of these years. After about 80-something um, years of being saved, she loves that verse. Yeah, we're going to suffer. We have become acquainted with the fellowship of his sufferings, Philippians chapter 3. We have victory over Satan and all of his forces of evil. Put on the whole armor of God, it says in Ephesians chapter 6, that she may be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, in high places, wherefore, for that reason, take unto you the whole armor of God. Review it in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. We have the victory through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I love Colossians 2.15. Colossians 2.15 says, And having spoiled... I'll talk about that in a minute. Principalities and power, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. The cross. The cross is our victory. The empty tomb is our victory. The blood of Jesus Christ. The power of the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. What does it mean to spoil principalities and power? The spoilers were those among the enemy camp that would come in and take everything good away. Take everything valuable away. And Jesus Christ turned the tables on the devil. And Satan thought that he had won the battle when Jesus was crucified. But Jesus crushed the head of the devil. And he spoiled principalities and power. And made a show of them openly. Triumphing over them in it. The cross and the empty tomb are our victory. We have victory over the... the forces of Satan. No fear, no judgment, no, no uh, apprehension about the devil. We have victory through Jesus Christ. Would you bow your head and close your eyes, every head? You've been viewing a service at Central Baptist Church. We never dismiss the service without clearly presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is, that Jesus came to this earth and sinlessly lived for 33 years before he voluntarily gave his life. He died on the cross, he was buried, he rose from the dead, and he's alive forevermore. Through the shedding of his blood and through his victory at uh, the, the empty tomb, Jesus Christ now offers salvation to you. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Would you pray right now from your heart to God and ask Him to save you? Something like this. Dear God, just pray, Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. I deserve to pay for my sins. I deserve to pay for my sins. I believe Jesus died to save me. I believe Jesus died to save me. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Right now, I receive the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Please take away my sins and take me to heaven when I die. Did you pray that prayer? Did you mean it? Wonderful. I want you to get in contact with us and let us know of your decision. Now, if you've already been saved, I want to encourage you to live the life that God would have you to live according to His Word. If you desire more instruction, more information, we'll be happy to supply it to you. We'd like to talk to you. The information is right here, and we'd love to speak to you. If you have any spiritual needs whatsoever, may God bless you.